so it's basically like it's based on my life. Yeah. And what I realized was I was making more money than I was like to my clients. I had about three hundred and fifty percent of my thought. I can take half of it and just and just give it away for free. Um each time I just go to the slides. So it's like personal about business transformation. They're easy to pick up, easy to share. So uh, that, that's the hope for February. It's um, two of the images I've been working on. Uh, and I had to pull out some of my slides. Like, 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 like. But I've um, got some of the other stuff that I bought. Um, I bought nice images. But I bought them for like personal and business. Ones. And I had to give them some of them. And I had to give them some of And it's not a hassle. Everyone's been really good. It's just, it's just not a hassle. So, um, that's taken up a bit of time. But I'm really happy with that. Because when it's done, I'll be like, challenge has been it's it's land so when we were texting it was like you couldn't use that it wasn't that true right away from that so I was like well actually so that's a bit of a problem and almost the same that people were looking at the iPad they were they were looking at like the presentation they weren't enjoying the reading aspect of this and I don't know how to fix that because my slides kind of work with do it the other way, it's like, you get like one at a different time. So yeah, I've been playing around with that, a little bit of text. Otherwise, it's been, uh, it's been really sad. No, I, 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 this is my only one that I specifically said, I don't want to do any this year. I want to take a little break. I want to uh, improve a little. I want to watch my videos. Um, and I was fairly happy to do it. <laughs> doing that. And uh, that I was happy doing this. I was like, I really want to do this for my one. And then, uh, I saw that. Yeah. I saw it. So and I operated too, but whatever I do on the slides, uh, at least the one I, because I keep getting all one thing, the one I get here. Yeah. No, that's all right. Yeah, no, my, 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 my. So I just think I've got one. Yeah, I've seen it so many people that are like, it was fine for me. I think it was like either file size or I had a video. So I guess we're at 606. Yeah, that's right, good, man. All right, cheers. No worries. I'll get some feet. I'll get some, uh, I'll get some event feedback from you maybe tomorrow. Are you here tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here to Monday, man. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. All right, hello. Thank you. I said hello. Hello. All right, we are at our second, the end of our second day. Uh, we've got another great keynote lined up, but of course we have housekeeping as we always do. We have uh, been seeing lots of activity with our hashtag, JWC13. Please continue to use that. I've been instructed by the marketing folks. Oh, I was expecting a slide there, but that's all right. <laughs> JWC13, thank you. Uh, also, another reminder, like yesterday, come back with your lanyards tomorrow or clip it to your jacket or something. Let's let everyone see that... Uh, that you're here for the event, okay? Uh, a little bit of audience participation is required, and I think I know most of the people who I'm talking to, I know they don't, they don't mind the extra attention. Uh, what I wanted to do was reach out to the Bug Squad folks who are going tonight for the 8 p.m. Bug Squad session that I've been nagging you about. Can you guys stand up, please, and stay up so we can see who you are? Who's at the Bug Squad tonight? Hans, let's get up. Come on, jump up. Stand up, I need everybody up. This is an exercise here, who else? Anyone up in the top? Stay, stay up, though. We need you up. Stay up. Please stay up. We're not done yet. Now, now, now that you're standing, now that you're standing, well-deserved applause. If you think that you want to go to the bug squad and you don't know who to talk to, look around. These guys standing up, talk to them, and please join them at the bug squad. 8 o'clock at the Petchet Rooms. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay, well, we've got a treat. We have another returning keynoter. Kevin John Gallagher is a transformation consultant who um, is really into agile thinking. And that's a really broad subject, so I really encourage you to talk to him about it after his session over dinner. Um, he's uh, from Edinburgh, but spends most of his uh, time working out of London. 
uh, and he's uh, been with many Fortune 500 companies. He's an ex-employee of uh, Microsoft, Cisco, and the BBC, and uh, really is a den denizen and kind of a influential figure when it comes to internet technologies and practices and um, many of the things that we all here do every day. So today he's going to give you a talk about something. Without further ado, Kevin John Gallagher. Hey, thanks, man. I really should have had the water at the start. Hello, everyone. My name is Kev Gallagher. Um, one of the things that Vic said to me before we started, he said, listen, don't be nervous. It'll just be like last year. It'll just be like San Jose. And I said, yeah, but the difference there was I'm now the Irishman in between developers and beer in Boston. <laughs> I'm currently the most hated man in Boston, and this is at a point in time when Ben Affleck is Batman. <laughs> I, it doesn't bode well for my, my well-being. So this is, uh, unsurprisingly, the Joomla World Conference. I know you guys know that, but it's just to make sure that the people videoing at home, specifically watching at home, is my mum. So this is very embarrassing because she's not great at the internet. So I'd like to tell her where I am. Uh, so my name's Kevin John Gallagher. Uh, there's normally like a bio slide here, but it's not really there. Uh, it's just a picture of my favorite wrestler, who I like to think I look like, but uh, not as much. My company, I'm not going to bore you with it, it's called Pure Web Brilliant, and we are business and digital change consultants. And what that means is we're not really good at developing stuff, and we don't want to develop stuff. What we want to do is change how people think about digital, how people think about businesses, how people think about themselves in the modern age. What we actually do is talk to people, solve a single problem, and leave. We never actually do any of the work. That's for other people. <laughs> and this is my talk, something, something, something website. So when I said that, here's my first question to a lot of people, because a lot of people tweeted about this when they first read it. Who heard something, something, something website in the voice of the emperor? <laughs> Some people did. All right, a lot more people watch Family Guy than I thought. On that note, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing that your brain does when it hears that information. It actually changes it around into a voice that it knows. It's not my voice, and it's not your voice. It's a different voice. And I love that our brains do that. They do it quite a lot. If you watch Futurama, a lot of people get that. If you don't, he has a very funny voice. But this, this is a really great thing that we sometimes do and we, we, we forget how awesome our brains are at processing a whole bunch of information at a single point in time. And sometimes we as developers and geeks really boil that down to, oh, it's just a cool website, but we never really remember why. So I'm apologizing in advance for this. This is not a talk about websites in any way, shape, or form. This is a talk about communication. There's already someone going for the door. <laughs> <laughs> TJ, I'm not talking about SEO. You're OK. <laughs> all right? Good grief. Yeah, so I apologize. It's not going to be about uh, websites at all, although we are going to talk about websites. It's about the thinking behind websites and how we communicate. One of my heroes is a guy called Tony Robbins. He's a big motivational talker. He's like six foot eight. He's very good looking. He's very rich. He is very, very unlike me sadly. But one of the things he says is if you want to emulate your heroes, you should understand their belief patterns and pick the bits you like about it. So I do that a lot. Tony Robbins has a really, really great quote which just resonates with me and I try and say it to all of my clients. The quality of my life is the quality of my communication. And it takes a little bit to sink in, but then you think, well actually yeah, it's about how I talk to myself about me, my own self-worth. And it's about how I talk to others and what they think of me and what I think of them. And when you get this, the quality of my life is the quality of my communication. And you can improve your communication. The quality of your life improves at the same time. Let me give some examples. So in personal communication, talking to yourself. Tony calls this uh, the inner civil war. But given that how many of us are geeks and sadly really nerdy, I've changed this to Gollum versus Smeagol, just to try and get it in. So we already saw the, the, the bug hunt guys, so Victor already threw my, my, my thunder a little bit. But realistically, how many people here are developers? Throw up your hands. All right. How many people like open source and want to contribute? How many people in an ideal world, if they were doing nothing else, would li really like to join the bug hunt and make Joomla better? All right. That's kind of cool. How many people want to come to the bar with me instead? <laughs> OK. Right, right, right. Exactly. 
Me and the bar are over here and the bug hunt are over there. This is the inner civil war that uh, we face every day. I call it Gollum and Smeagol, just for you guys. But it's we want to do lots of different things. I want to be really, really great in what I do and work and help people and all the rest of it. But actually, there's a part of me that really just wants to lie on the beach. Obviously, in the shade, because I'm Irish and I would burn. But yeah, that's, that's it. So like, we face these inner civil wars all the time. In terms of communicating with others, how many people have ever uh, released some open source code like a, 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 in the extension directory for Joomla? How many people have really enjoyed getting thanks and it made their life a little bit better? Let's go. How many people have thanked anyone else for an extension they got for free? OK. And when you thanked someone else, did you feel better about it? Right. And you, so it's all about improving the quality of life that we have by improving our communication with others. Humans communicate in a really, really funny way uh, in terms of only 10% of communication from a face-to-face -face contact is the words we used, 40% is the tone of our voice, and 50% is body language. So if I was to stand at the front and just sit there and read this and all the rest of it and read the whole thing, you guys would think a lot less of me. Which is not to say that if I stand here and say it up front, you guys are going to believe me anymore, but you might have a slightly better chance, especially because in the last slide I offered everyone beer. When we're not talking to a human directly, though, we actually communicate in a slightly different way. Our brains process it differently. The study for this is HCI. It's human-computer interaction. It's pretty interesting, but a little bit dry to get into. We still only believe uh, and process 10% of the communication as words that we use. 30% is tone of voice. But 30% is difficulty of understanding. And 20% is outside messages. And this is a really funny thing for people to try and get. Uh, one of my favorite websites, or favorite bits of content, is the Forbes website, oddly enough, because I'm geeky and I like business stuff. Yet the problem is, that as soon as I click on the link, the first thing Forbes do is throw up a big shadow box with an advert. And so I'm like, well, I get the communication. I know I want it. But the 20% of that that's outside messages is just telling me, screw that. I'm going to read the Harvard Business Review instead. And I really hope someone from Forbes sees that and turns that bloody advert off, because it's annoying. And we kind of get this at base level, but we also deep down think that the words mean more. We believe that actually, no, it's, it's, it's about the words. We can see past people. We can see through people. So let me say this. Your call is important to us. And it's said in a very sincere voice over and over again. Does anyone believe that? <laughs> no, we know that. But it's said in a sincere voice. And, it, and the words are true. Your call is important to us. When realistically, all we're thinking is, there'll be more lies down the line. But we do that in open source as well. We've changed over time what words we use. We no longer start to believe them in the same tone. Patch is welcome. When open source really kicked off and, and we were all contributing and all the rest of it, patch is welcome was this great thing. You know, hey, you know what? You can fix it. That's brilliant. Come on, just send us the code. We're really open to that. But over the last couple of years, as we've tried to stabilize some things, and there's some core people and some new people and all the rest of it, actually, Patch's welcome has really, really changed in its tone and how people take it on board, mostly because Patch's welcome is a phrase that's said to shut people up. Patch's welcome, while the words mean one thing, is actually a really passive aggressive tone. I actually tried to contribute uh, a change to uh, a, an open source project last year uh, for an accessibility fix. I didn't know the code because I'm not a developer, but I said, this doesn't work on a screen reader. It actually breaks down. And this was the reply I got. Sorry, I can't hear your opinion over your lack of code patches and track. So there's a patch welcome, and you're allowed to submit it, i.e., we don't want to hear your problem unless you're a good enough developer. We've changed what the great phrase of patch is welcome means to we now set it up for if your code is good enough to get past this, then maybe we'll talk to you. Maybe. It's a really funny change. The other one is this. If we're now talking on 140 characters a lot on Twitter, our communication is shortened, which means things are, are being perceived as ruder more and more because you can't really explain it well. If you're unhappy about something and you take to Twitter to do it, and you, instead of explaining it to someone, just write this code instead, you're doing it wrong in a function. You're just being an asshole. Just stop it. We, we have much better ways of saying, actually, that has changed. Actually, we're doing this now. You, we need to bring people with us. And we in the open source community have somewhat stopped doing that in the last couple of years, unintentionally. 
What we need is simple and concise communication constantly to talk to each other. It drives engagement. It makes people want to help a great deal. One of the things I heard from a, a client not too long ago was they were really confused about the move from Joomla 1.7 to 2.5 as a milestone instead of 2.0 or 3, and that 3.5 will be the next one. And we sat and explained it to them. But they had said, listen, that's really great. One of the things that we've not had is we, we Googled that, and we didn't get a really simple explanation. We gave a geeky explanation on the Joomla website. We didn't give an explanation that we could replicate one for one to clients that maybe don't know what we're talking about. We just need to remember just to simplify it and have a really great tone of voice. More importantly, we have to remember that we're no longer alone. This is a quote from my dad, and I don't know where he stole it from. Uh, but it's, no man is an island unless his name is Madagascar. And I've, I've, I've loved it ever since he told me it. But whatever you do has ripple effects in how you communicate with everyone around you. And we love open source, and we love the web, and we love communication. Yet we've been getting slightly less good at this over the last number of years. And I think we can change it. So, so that the geeks don't get too bored, we need to talk about the internet. Bill Gates, one of my heroes, and I know he's not a very popular man. <laughs> uh, but during his, uh, he's done many TED talks, which incidentally you should definitely watch. Uh, but the, one of my favorite ones is his talk about innovation to zero. Uh, and what he said there is that the cost of energy is the defining factor in innovation. The actual quote is, advanced civilizations are based on advances in energy. And he talked about from horses to the Egyptians to oil to electricity and, and on it goes. My problem is that I actually really, really disagree with that. Because until the digital age, until the last 15 to 20 years, the cost of energy and the cost of information was exactly the same thing. The cost of you feeding the horse to go and deliver the mail was the cost of the energy to feed the horse and the cost to deliver the, the message that went with it. Energy and information traveled at the same speed. That's definitely no longer true. We no longer have dial-up. We're on all the time. We can just send multiple emails for the same cost. Cost and energy are no longer the constraining factors on the speed of information. And that's been a real massive change for us, and it's seen a real leap in innovation over the last 15 years, as we've all seen. We used to be able to describe the internet to people in really simple terms. We used to describe it in terms of speed, because no one knew what the internet really was outside of our circles in like 95, 96. So how do we describe it to people? We described it in really simple communication. Rather than confuse them with jargon, we said, it, it's the information superhighway. It's a really fast place where you can get lots of things, and you know what it's about? It's about information. That's what we started with the web, a place for information where we can get it quickly. Now we've got Facebook. The real challenge over the last two years is we've somewhat forgotten that. We've started like separating the web in our head. Oh, there's the open web, the web that counts. We've got a semantic web. We've got a mobile web. We've got a dark web where apparently everyone's trading all our information. We've got the real web. I don't know what the unreal web is, but we actually have, apparently have a real web. We've got an underweb, and we've got a Facebook web. Apparently, that's what Facebook are trying to build, a separate internet on Facebook.com on the real internet. I don't know how that's going to work, but, the, <laughs> but, but that is the massive fear that somehow Facebook are, have got a hidden internet somewhere, and we're all going to be on it one day. The thing is, we solved this problem in 1992. We don't need to worry about whether it's open or semantic or what the word before web is. And the main thing we forgot is this. We solved the problem. We called it the World Wide Web. It encompasses everything. It's for everyone. It's an information superhighway for everyone around the world to get the information and communication that they want. We did the best thing. We covered it in the title. When was the last time any of you guys called it the World Wide Web? Anyone do it in the last year? Like, unsarcastically. Because <laughs> I've called it sarcastically, you know, in terms of, oh, I see the NSA are on the World Wide Web. You know, yes. I'll just apply for my ESTA. Are you an American? No. Oh, 17 pages of the World Wide Web. Yeah. You know, I've done that, but I haven't referred to it as the World Wide Web to a client in years. I haven't referred to it as the information superhighway since the 90s. I, I had, like, long hair in the 90s and was thin. 
Listen. Tim Berners-Lee, the man that, that gets the credit for inventing uh, the web, had this quote right at the start of the internet, and it, it, he put it and tweeted it during the, the Olympics last year when, when, in London when he covered the uh, whole stadium in it. And the message was about the web. This is for everyone. And I think a lot of us have kind of forgotten that. It's an information superhighway that gives information. It's a world wide web for absolutely everyone. And it, it's, this is for everyone. And we've kind of really moved away from that. So I'm going to really ask for something weird, given that I'm in between everyone and beer. Can I get a hell yeah? Hell yeah. That was better than I thought. Excellent. And just because. My, to wake my mum up, can I get another great hell yeah for the web? Hell yeah! You guys are awesome. That's good. That's really good. Thank you. Okay, so this is when things are about to get a little hairy. They're about to go downhill a little bit because I'm about to ask you guys some questions. You don't need to shout out. You just need to put up your hands a little bit. We'll try and make it a little bit interactive. Does anyone know what this is? Yes, it's, it's, it's the world. That's right. Okay, so who gave Brian the beer earlier? Does anyone remember me saying, just put your hand up? <laughs> Sorry, Brian. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, so this is, remember, information for everyone, world and all the rest of it. This is the map of everywhere there's an Apple store as of yesterday. Yeah. It's for everyone, absolutely everyone. We're all about information for everyone. As long as you're not in Asia, India, Middle East, Africa, Central America, or South America, we think we're all the same, we just don't want you to have it. No, I understand market forces are in play here, so I'm not really having a go at Apple. It's just we think a lot, and we're bombarded a lot with messages for everyone has an iPhone, everyone has iOS. You know, it's out there. And we, we've kind of got into that way of thinking. I know when I go to agencies a lot, a lot of their testing revolves around that. Yet actually, in terms of Apple stores, just, they're, they're, they're nowhere near everywhere. If you were to take all the countries that don't have an Apple store and you were to put them all together in a big ball, as of yesterday, it would be two times the size of Pluto that don't have access to Apple products. Given that Pluto's no longer a planet, I couldn't find a really good picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not my fault. When I grew up, Pluto was a planet. Now it's just like something way over there. Uh, I don't know. I, I, what, what do we call that, actually? Something. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah, we call it something. Brilliant. Yeah, that's actually much better. Yeah, the whole thing. Something, 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 yeah. Something, 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 Pluto. Yeah. So here's a quick question, I, I, and this is quite geeky. Here are two input tags uh, that, that go in, in, in the header. Hands up if you use the top one uh, for, uh, for iOS so that if anyone uses it, you get like the little, um, the little icon. Okay, cool. The bottom one is for uh, Windows 8 for tiles. Hands up if you use that on your last website. One. <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. That's all right. Because as we know, like iOS has been around since 2007. It's you know changed mobile. It's all the rest of it. And Windows 8 has not been around that long, and we don't really like it and all the rest of it. The challenge is that there are more Windows 8 machines sold and activated in the first 13 months than there have been in total iOS devices sold. All the iPhones, all the iPads, the iPad mini, and all the rest of it. And we're currently releasing three iPads every 17 months. There's 17 months between the iPad 3, the iPad 4 thing, the mini, and the, the iPad Air. And people are buying them. People are buying them. We're buying them. But there was more Windows 8 machines, sorry, English language, Windows 8 machines sold in the world than iOS devices in total in 13 months. Yet, as we've just seen, the number of people that are putting in code for an iOS device is vastly more than the one person who put in the code for Windows 8. And I, I want to get into that. I want to get into our thinking behind it. So four quick questions on mobile testing. How many people test their website on an iPhone? Yeah, me. How many people test it on a Windows phone? All right, about uh, quite a bit less. I would say like a quarter. Uh, how many people test it on an Android phone? OK, more than iOS. That's awesome. How many people test it on the three biggest versions of Android? All right, a lot less. Cool, and I totally understand that. 
Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Who tests it on a Blackberry? <laughs> Good. Good. I'm, I'm really, really pleased at that, because I was about to tell you just to fucking leave. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's... What the hell are you doing here, man? <laughs> All right, so mobile testing, we do that. So basically, a lot of people test on a single version of Android. Almost the same people test on, on, on an iOS, uh, and, and about a quarter of that test on, on, on Windows. Here's the thing, as of uh, last week, Android is an 81% market share in the world. iOS only has 13%. And thanks to a really great growth, because they bought Nokia and, and, and it's doing really well in Europe, oddly in Italy as well, Windows has grown from a 0.2% market share to a 4.2% market share in the last two years. And it's not eating uh, Google's market share, it's eating Apple's. And, well, Blackberries, but let's be honest, that doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't. It, count, it counts for 1% of enterprises that haven't learned to upgrade. Them. Yeah, it's, it's all phones, that's exactly. Who's surprised to hear that Windows Phone in a worldwide market has uh, just over a third of the share of total iOS devices? All right, cool. Three people thought Windows were doing better than they were. That's all right. Yet, the really funny thing is, if we look at that, how many people are now going to start considering testing on Windows phones, given that they've got a 4% market share of the entire world, about 7 billion people? Okay. This is the uh, split up of uh, Android devices by, by their large three OSs. The number of people on Gingerbread, which is one version ago, I think, um, is more than the number of people on iOS and Windows, and BlackBerry, and whoever the hell the others are, Symbian and stuff, put together. Ice Cream, which is the one before that, has exactly the same number of devices active right now as iOS and Windows put together. And Jelly Bean, the latest one, has more than double the number of active devices um, as iOS and Windows and BlackBerry put together. Yeah, actually, if we just turn around and break it based on the stats, only about 10 of you tested on multiple Android devices. So even if you're actually testing on, let's even say, the big one, you're still missing out on about 40% of the market that you're not testing on. And I'm not really worried about how you guys do testing. Everyone's just testing on their own. My testing's terrible. It's really, really terrible. It's more a case of... What's the thought process behind that? What's the thought process that says we're going mobile first, we, we want to embrace mobile, it's the future. Are we going to test on it? Ooh. Oh, it's half four. You know, how many people genuinely, when you're testing on a mobile, turn Wi-Fi off? That's not a lot of hands. It, and I, I'm really terrible for that. We had a situation last year where the, the .NET magazine in, in, in UK, it's a really great magazine, uh, they, they gave a best responsive website uh, award um, last year. And it was to a really good website. The thing is, they only tested it uh, in, in, uh, with an iOS device, and they only tested it in the office. It was 7.2 megs of a home page. <laughs> but the pictures were beautiful. They were responsive. Yay, responsive. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It took four and a half minutes to download on 3G on the outside. One of my clients uh, was testing it in, in, in New York, a website. And I said, this is going really slow. And he said, no, it's going really fast for me. And I said, listen, have you turned Wi-Fi off? And he says, yes, because you're sarcastic. I knew you would ask. And I was like, great. I was like, well, what, what signal have you got? I've got pretty good signal. He's like, oh, yeah, it's awesome. I'm on 4G. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in Scotland. We have 2G <laughs> as a country. You know, and, and, you know, Scotland's not an important country in terms of the internet. We, we, yet yeah, it's not. We invented the television at monitors and we invented the telephone line. Things that are not used for the internet, apparently. We only have 2G. So if you're testing on 4G, you're not testing like everyone else. What's the thought process behind our test? And that's really what I get into. And while we're on mobile, let's go at something slightly sketchier. I'm trying to change your thing. Yeah, I'm not moaning about iOS. I'm a little moaning about iOS. iOS 7's crap. How many people test on a screen reader for their last website? That's not bad. That's much better than I thought. It's all right. I don't believe you. <laughs> don't believe you in this latest. I believe some of you, in fairness, but, like, but Pete's hand up the back kind of went, 
I don't really know. That's a much better question. Pete, what, what screen reader did you test? NVDA. All right. <laughs> he literally good as said anything. He's Australian. Uh, so in terms of accessibility stats, uh, webam.org is, is a really good website that's trying really hard to make accessibility much easier for us to understand. It's not got there yet because the current like WCAG standards is 517 pages and we're expected to know that for every website. But it's trying really, really hard and you should definitely check it out. When they did their survey last year, 97% of people used a screen reader for a disability and 3% of people apparently were just bored. But 47% of those people use JAWS, which is the most popular. That's what they used at home. But about 63% of them used it at work or across the board. 12% used uh, window eyes and 12% used voiceover. That's mostly because you can now get voiceover um, on your mobile phone, by the way, which is really good. So if you're ever testing on a mobile phone, test a screen reader on the mobile phone, you will be scared about how bad your website sounds. <laughs> to start with, it can't pronounce Kevin John. So I'm always screwed on the first letter. The JAWS website people don't like their actual software being any form of reference to the film JAWS. And they like, get really, really angry to videos and get them taken down off Joomla. So I'm not going to do that. So this is me not referencing JAWS. <laughs> yeah, fuck up. <laughs> they don't like me. Does anyone know how much the world's most popular screen reader costs? All right, so we're going to do a quick poll. Who thinks it costs about $200? Cool. Uh, who, about, it's not free, incidentally. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, who who uh, thinks it's about $500? It's pretty good. Who thinks it's about $1,000? Um, and who thinks it's like over $1,000? Cool. The current price, if you live in the US, it's more expensive if you're not in the US because obviously you're a second class citizen, is $1,095 in order for you to be able to use the internet. Welcome to freedom, everyone. Welcome to information for everyone. That'll be $1,500, please. How many people here wear glasses? I know. What if you had to pay for your glasses every year for $1,000? Would you be kind of pissed off? Yeah. OK. Would you be really pissed off if then no one tested their website on it? <laughs> yeah. You couldn't, you, the, the, yeah, well, that's exactly it. The really funny thing about it is, um, what happens is, is that JAWS updates every year in October. Every year it does it. We're on version 15. And in fairness, there are really good increases every time. But because it costs $1,000, no one buys the upgrade unless it's something really substantial, like they've moved to Windows 8 and you only get Windows 8 support in the last two versions. So if you even go and buy JAWS just now, because I've convinced you to go testing, you're actually not testing on what everyone else is using anyway, because most people are three to four versions behind. Because of this, testing on the latest version isn't a viable solution. And when it, we've got a really great way of dealing with that as geeks. Does anyone know what we do when we can't properly test and we don't really know what we're doing? We do this. There's, um, uh, there's no IE6 in my analytics, so I'm not going to test for it. We do that a lot. Does anyone know that Google Analytics next month is no longer going to tell you if anyone comes for IE7 unless you give them 100 grand? You guys know that, right? So I've been on their blog for about a year. Yep. In the same way, it no longer tests for IE6. So if someone comes to your website in IE6 and you don't have the premium account because it's sampling data, it doesn't tell you that someone's turned up in IE6. So literally overnight, the stats on Google Analytics for IE6 around the world went from about 2% to zero. And someone turned around and went, we've killed IE6. How? <laughs> Jesus, how did you do that? We stopped counting it. <laughs> Don't ignore it. Ignore it. We'll just tell everyone it's gone. That's what we're doing. We've, we've done great that. That's how we've killed IE6, by the way. We've stopped counting it. And this is what we're doing with screen readers as well. And lots of things that aren't within our uh, bounds of normality. The thing is, it's not just blindness, and I'm putting that in quotes because that's the phrase we use a lot, whereas really the phrase is vision impairment, I kind of presume it. But it's about low vision. It's about color blindness. Incidentally, as you get older, you're, uh, you definitely start to get color blindness. In men, it's about 50. In women, it's about 60. And it increases between 5 to 10% every five years going on from there. And it's especially bad for blues and yellows and green. 
So again, what's the question? Who has an, uh, an iPhone and reads green and blue iMessages? How many of those people upgraded to iOS 7 where the text used to be black and is now white on green? Yeah, I did. I can't read it, incidentally. I'm, 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 I'm colorblind, so I see white on yellow, so I can't do it. So whenever I can upgrade, I'm getting rid of my iOS 7. Color contrast is a really big thing as well. We don't test for that in the slightest, and we really, really should, because you're meant to have a color contrast of 4.5 to 1. That's the ratio. Yet if you take the links on the Joomla homepage, it's 2.1. If you take the links on the WordPress homepage, it's 1.8. If you take the links on the Drupal homepage, it's about 3.8. Not one of our major CMS's homepage on open source meets the bare minimum of the accessibility standards. Is anyone else a little embarrassed by that, that we just didn't click on the button? I'm a little embarrassed. I think we can do better. But we've stopped thinking about accessibility. We've stopped thinking about what people really need because we've buried our head in the sands just a little bit. Here's where I'm going to start getting really unpopular. In 2012, a CMS that we're not going to name, uh, with over 15% market share, had its two releases that year, coded to make it impossible to log out of the admin screen unless you used a mouse. You didn't use a mouse? Why are you on the internet? internet? The menu also changed from text in an icon to an icon only, and the menu appeared once you hovered over it. You didn't use a mouse? Oh yeah, you've got, to, you've got to tab the whole way down and press return twice. Why don't you just use a mouse, man? Well, actually, I may have a disability and all the rest of it. Right, so you want special treatment. <laughs> so, the icon color has changed from a dark gray on top of a light gray to a slightly lighter gray on top of the same light gray. So it failed the basics of the Royal National Institute of the Blind, the WCAG, and the Section 508 accessibility standards in the US. But that's OK. It only runs 15% of the web. No one really. They also said that it became mobile friendly because it became responsive. Can I just ask, who, who has a hover menu on their phone? <laughs> I realize that's me being a bit of a dick, but that, like, sometimes it takes someone saying something. Someone sent me this during a, during a thing last year, that he's really happy. He now is an excuse to fire his disabled people that like, want a ramp instead of the stairs, just so he can continue to use his CMS. In fact, it's kind of worse than that, really. What's this? <laughs> and the question I always get asked when I start these talks, and people feel a little bit hard done to. And I totally get why people do, by the way. This is meant to be jarring. I'm trying to change your I'm not trying to be really nice about this. How many people is it affecting? Here's the thing. I don't care. And you shouldn't care either. If it affects one person, well, that's not this is for everyone. That's what we hell yet. This is for everyone. Not this is for everyone, ooh, as long as we like them, and they're white, and they're American, and they speak English. That's not what we're about. It's about the World Wide Web. It's web for everyone. So I don't care if it's one person or one percent. We need to start thinking about this at a base level. Edge cases don't exist. This is the other thing that really pisses me off, and, and quite badly. When someone says, oh, yeah, but they're, they're, they're running this on a, on a, a weird version of, of uh, Windows. We no longer support Windows XP. We no longer support Windows 8. It's just kind of weird or they're on a screen reader and they don't use a mouse. Edge cases don't exist. You just haven't tested well enough. You just haven't thought it through. If you do your testing and you only test it on Chrome, and you don't test it on Safari because it's kind of the same, that's not really testing. How many people, when they launch a website, actually test it on a browser matrix of all 14 browsers that are on major versions with over a 1% market share around the world on all the major versions of operating systems? I don't, incidentally. I start the first two and just think, it seems fine. Someone will. I do. I do. That's, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm not here telling you guys that, that I'm brilliant. and, and this, I'm, I'm telling you that I, I hate myself a little bit. And that's all right. The other one I hear a lot is 80-20. Well, we're going to please 80% of the people. We can't please everyone. Can I just ask, 
If, if, if I went into Walmart and they said, we're going to piss off 20% of the people so they never come back, do you think that would be a really good idea? I mean, I know Walmart do piss off 20% of the people and we still go back. But, but the reality is, as a concept, who came up with that as a business plan? Who, you can't go to the bank and go, I've got a, better, a really good idea. I'm going to invite lots of people in to use my shop or my website and all the rest of it. And I'm going to piss 20% of them off on purpose because I'll please, maybe please the other 80. It's a really bad excuse. And it's one that we've let perpetuate for a little while. And we're better than that. I believe that. So here's my, my little bit of sarcasm, which works really well in a Glaswegian accent. Not that many people understand the Glaswegian accent. I'm sorry, is testing hard? Is accessibility hard? Yeah, it kind of is. Does it take too much time? It does. I get that. But that's not a really good excuse. What were you doing instead over the last 15 years, rather than uh, getting accessibility right, getting standards right? Oh, that's right. We took nine years to write the HTML5 spec. That was a good use of time. Here's what we were doing instead. We were changing our mind on what was the best for the web. In the last 15 years, we've had DHTML, pure JavaScript, ActionScript Flex, Prototype, Script Ulysses, MooTools, ASP.NET, VB.NET, which is dead, C Sharp, which is doing all right, J Sharp, which we killed after three years. We've got Ruby. Uh, we've got Node.js. That's obviously the, the new one, the great one. We've got Backbone.js. We've got Perl. We've got CGI. We've got PHP. Eh? Uh, we've got jQuery. We've got a bunch of other stuff, and there's people out there creating new stuff all the time. Constantly, we're reinventing the wheel. Constantly, we're saying, hey, you know what? The best thing to use this year is this. Oh, have you, have you solved the accessibility problem with it? Oh, no, but look at this. We can compile JavaScript. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you do it without a mouse? <laughs> uh, fuck. Do we get a lot of that? Maybe, maybe, maybe we should just stop chasing the dragon of the latest, greatest, newest technology. And maybe we should turn around and go, you know what? Let's actually make it work for everyone. What a crazy idea. This is for everyone. A world wide web. You know, if only we'd thought about it 20 years ago. And if only we'd called it that so like, we could try and be subtle about it. Here's my other thing that annoys people. And I'm trying really hard not to swear as very often. So best practices are that word. How do you know it's best? Really? How do you know the context of what it's going to use it in? I personally really love responsive design. But when someone says to me that responsive design is the best way to build a website ever, and it will be forever, I'm like, how do you know that? Isn't it really arrogant, actually, as a word, best practices? Doesn't it sit slightly jarringly in your head? Everyone uses technologically differently. <laughs> so, I did not do well in math at school. No well at all. Yeah, that's it. What's worse is someone had to show me it. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that, 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 that's the real embarrassment of it. Yeah. Um, there's no right and wrong way to use technology. There might be a way where a lot of people use it. There might be the way that most people use it. But we can't turn around and say, hey, you know what? You're using your keyboard wrong, because we don't like that. Just be glad that people are using your technology, and that they're delivering value from it. My suggestion with this, and this is a, across the board, is to replace whatever rules you have with guidelines and requests. Rules are really restrictive, yet we talk about them an awful lot. Well, you can't do that. You shouldn't use Internet Explorer. How many, oh, here's a great one. Uh, how many people have a thing on their website that pops up if someone is using IE6 and tells them, piss off, I don't like your choice of browser that you're using on your computer? That's awesome. When did that person say, what I'd really like for you to do is be condescending about what software I use on my computer to do what I want with my time? I get it. But I mean, it's not even like we've let it go, where it's like, hey, you know what, it might not work. We've actually spent the time to say to someone, we're better than you. It's a really arrogant thing that we've done. And I've got it on one of mine, incidentally. Uh, so I get it. But I'm OK with being arrogant. 
I'm, I'm a man in a skirt. I'm all right. It's, it's just, there's, there's a certain swagger that comes with this. It's me than Ric Flair. But in terms, of, in terms of rules and guidelines, take the gremlin as a great example. He was given three rules. Don't let it see light, but you let it watch TV. You know, there's, there's plot holes in that film all over the place. Don't, don't get it wet and don't feed it after midnight. And what's the first thing he did was rules, huh? And he gave it some food and then he and all hell broke loose and it killed his neighbor. If those rules were replaced with guidelines that actually said, please don't get it wet because it will have 17 children and they're idiots, the guy would be like, oh, I can't look after one mogwai. I sure as hell don't want seven. If they said, don't feed it after midnight because it turns into a thing that will kill your neighbor, he probably wouldn't have fed it. Guidelines are so much better because they have context and people can understand it. And it's much easier for people to get on board and believe your guidelines than when we give people just simple rules. So instead of best practices, use this phrase instead, patterns of excellence. It's a neuro-linguistic programming phase, phrase. And it's one that resonates really well in the brain. Because on the whole, you still get that great value. You still get the excellence part of it. And it's a pattern, so it's repeatable. Responsive design is a wonderful pattern for excellence, but it doesn't say it is 100% the best option ever. The other thing I want us to do in terms of talking to ourselves is let's use inclusion instead of diversity. Remember what I said at the start, the quality of my life is the quality of my communication. That starts with ourselves and others. If you use the word diversity, your brain automatically thinks of splitting something up. It can't help it. It's like if I say, don't imagine a pink elephant on top of a penguin. Who imagines something different? Your brain doesn't work in negatives. One word is about us being together. One, one split word splits us up from the base perception. So communicate your, better with yourself and others. My dad once explained it to me, and he'll be really embarrassed if my mum's woken him up. He really explained it to me like this, and I hope that this is the thing that sinks in, folks. He called it one ply versus three ply. He said, never date a woman who has only one ply toilet paper. She doesn't love herself, son, she won't love you. <laughs> it is really weird to go to someone's house and, and ask to go to the bathroom and see their cupboard, so there's, there's no getting away from it. So part of this was something, something, something website. And what I wanted to do when I started this was create a website, which I did, and asked everyone to go and describe their last website and what the three words were. Replace something, something, something with what you think of as your website. How would you communicate what your website is to me in three words? And we got like great response. It's, uh, it's incredible to see what, what the difference in thoughts from everyone was. Some people came in and thought it was really, really technical. So they're like, it's Joomla, PHP, MySQL. Some people talked about their process of responsive or mobile first or all the rest of it. Some people uh, said, oh, it's a client site, or it's boring, or it's this. It's really funny to see how different people react about different websites. We had just over 2,000 responses in about three weeks. So my first thing is to thank everyone that did it and thank everyone that retweeted it because I'm really crap at Twitter and lots of people are a lot better in the edit. So I like, that's, that's just me being really thankful for that. Here's what happened. Here are the words, the top 10 words that were in the, uh, in the three fields. Responsive came up 67 times and it was going down Joomla, PHP, WordPress, mobile, HTML5, mobile for CSS, jQuery, and blog. And that's really great. Everything under that was about 1%. There was lots of little other things. Do you know what words are not up there? Accessible, usable, multilingual, friendly, interesting, fun. Do you know what those words all constitute? Things from the user perspective. Everyone wrote about the website as they thought of it. And every single person almost thought about the website in terms of them physically building it. How many websites do you think filled in a word close to accessible, user-friendly, multilingual, easy to navigate, interactive, simple, readable, and I had a list, incidentally, of anything from the user point of view. Out of just over 2,000 answers, of which you can choose three words, how many of those 6,000 words had anything to do with these?
Because we don't think about the user. We think we think about it. We talk about user-centric design. That's awesome. Right up until the point where we build the thing, then we're like, well, we've thought about the user. <laughs> Stupid, annoying client website, <laughs> which is hilarious, <laughs> appeared four times. <laughs> And because I didn't ask for names or email addresses or anything like that, I just I captured the IP so I could tell which country in the world they were in. These, people, these four were scattered. It is not the same person that did it four times because he was just that annoyed. <laughs> or if he did, he went into an awful lot of trouble. It might be Pete. Pete's flown around, around the world though, quite a bit. <laughs> Two people wrote this. <laughs> Again, separate. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, so one, one was in Europe and one was in the US that did this. And here's the thing that really hit me. Two people wrote this exact phrase, and out of the other 2,000 answers, uh, only two people mentioned anything from the user point of view. And it kind of got me thinking. We've kind of forgotten what the web was like, or what it was about. So here's what I want. I've got five minutes left, and I'm going to try and be slightly less preachy about it, but I'm not going to succeed. What I want to do is change how we think about the web. What I, I don't want to talk about the stats, and I don't want to talk about best practices, because I really hate best practices. I want this to be an insight to you guys, so that someone will take it away and go, you know what, we probably better see if we can get a free version of that screen reader, at least see what our website works on. I want us to change what we do in terms of development and in terms of the internet. I want us to transform our industry from something it is just now, glorified, bad, madman marketing, into something that it meant to be in the first place. Information superhighway, World Wide Web, this is for everyone. Here's a really thing that I really love. One, I, some of you guys saw the, the bit this slide yesterday. Know the business you're in, not the business you think you're in. Warren Buffett has a really awesome phrase where he says, it's okay to hold a rock concert, and it's okay to hold a ballet, but if you're going to hold a rock concert, make sure you don't advertise it as a ballet. And then I got thrown out of an interview or, or, or a session like this with him because I was stupid enough to shout at the back, just be careful which Alice Cooper you book. <laughs> we think we're in the industry of communicating out there to people and they come for our beautiful websites and they come to buy stuff and they come for e-commerce and all the rest of it and it's not about information. Jeff Bezos uh, once got an email that said, why do you allow negative um, reviews on Amazon.com? You make money when people buy books off you. And he said, that's not the business I'm in. I make money when people believe the reviews, good and bad, and they get the information, and they make their own decision, because then people trust us. Amazon aren't into e-commerce. Amazon are into giving us information in the hope that we then buy stuff from them. Know the, inform know the business you're in. So here's what I did. I came up with a, a list of about 100. Uh, things that I test my website for before they go live. And I threw down the 10 really basic ones. Is there a fav icon to ICO in the route? That, that became the standard in 1994, by the way. So 19 years. Uh, fav icon .png in the route. Is there robots.txt? Is there sitemap to XML? Does the website have a print style sheet? Seems fairly basic. It, it, does it say what the character set is? And is it right or left direction? Does it have a viewport meta tag? Does it have the open graph tag with a title and an image, even if it's just the same for the entire site? Does any of your style sheets overwrite focus so that screen readers can't use it and people can't tab? Because, by the way, the, uh, the original um, Eric Myers uh, CSS reset used to do that until 2008. Uh, can you visibly navigate the page without a mouse? So I took these 10 things, and I wrote a little script, again, poor developer, um, so it might not be brilliant. But I did that uh, for the top 100 websites from Joomla, Drupal, and WordPress that are out of the Alexa top 100. Or top 1 million, sorry. Not one of those criteria of my 10 basics of a website were met by over 80% of the websites. Who doesn't have a robots.txt file at this point in time? But 20% of the websites didn't. More than 50% of the websites tested reset the focus so that you couldn't tab through it. Because again, why aren't you using a mouse? Less than 50% of the websites tested had a print style sheet. Why would you print it? Why aren't you on a mobile? 
We've changed the way we think about the web. We no longer think that it's for everyone. We no longer think that information is for the other people to decide how they interact with it. We want it set up how we want people to interact with our websites. We really need to change our thinking, let alone our development. You guys are much better developers than I, and I'm not going to tell you how to do that. But I am saying that maybe we've lost a little bit of our way here. Here's the thing. Out of those 10, you can fix them all in an hour. Most of them are copy and paste. It's really, really easy to fix in an hour. So why didn't we? Why didn't we do it in the first place? Again, well, most of us don't have an hour, and someone wasn't paying us for it. Like, I get that. But actually, in terms of our thinking, who doesn't want a fav icon? When did we decide that we're only going to put a PNG in because we just don't care about Internet Explorer? Like any version of it. So here's what I wanted to end on. I wanted to end on something really epic, like save the cheerleader, save the world, you know, something really catchy. And I, I realized I wasn't going to be able to do that. But I wanted to change it a little bit. Something, something, something website. That's the thing that caught everyone's imagination at the start. It's a really easy thing to remember. I want to change this instead to the tiny things to fix the basics of the web. One hour, one website. Forget the damn cheerleader. Let's save the World Wide Web by actually making sure that we've raised the basics. Let's ensure that we remember that the web is for everyone. It's the World Wide Web. Thank you very much. All right, lots of food for thought as always. I need you to stay in your seats for a second if you want to hear the last final housekeeping items. Kevin is here tonight and all tomorrow. Please make uh, a great chance to introduce yourself and ask him about everything we heard about. Uh, I was really proud that we've got a robots.txt file, right? We don't Woo! even have to worry about that one. Woo! <laughs> all right, that little file got some respect. Tiny little housekeeping. Um, tonight, oh, Fred. Fred, you've lost your bag with all your stuff. Come up and get it. It's right here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Um, the food tonight is the same as it was last night. It's split up, but we learned from our mistake of last night and having two bars. We only have one tonight. It's going to be outside the cafe on the first floor, which oddly is up the first set of stairs. Okay. Uh, the group photo tomorrow is right after the keynote. Um, if you have a flight to catch later in the day, please be sure you're here for Matt Mullenweg's keynote. Uh, right after lunch. As if you don't know who that is, that's the uh, CEO of Automatic and the creator of WordPress. So it's going to be really great to have him here talking about community, coming from a kind of a cousin community on the other side. And of course, the beverages tonight are provided by SiteGround. So thank you, SiteGround, for your generous sponsorship. And uh, everyone enjoy a drink from SiteGround. <laughs>